Dr. Freed, Dr. Early, and colleagues, uh, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to discuss our data. The presentation will again cover the value of routine follow timed barium esophagram and achalasia after myotomy. I have nothing to disclose. Our institution routinely performs time barium esophagram, or TBE, for achalasia patients. In brief, a patient consumes a standard amount of barium, and a chest x-ray is performed at one and five minutes with the radiologist recording the height and width of the column. These findings, uh, these images demonstrate typical TBE findings for an achalasia patient. The TBE quantifies the esophageal emptying and is helpful in assessing early outcomes after Heller myotomy. In achalasia, patient symptoms do not correlate with esophageal emptying and therefore cannot optimally assess the adequacy of palliation by Heller myotomy. Because TBE provides an objective measure of esophageal emptying, we employ routine follow-up TBE in our achalasia patients after Heller myotomy in order to assess the adequacy of palliation as measured by esophageal emptying. At our institution, from 1995 to 2013, 559 patients underwent laparoscopic Heller myotomy with 1,335 follow-up TBEs. The mean age of the patients was 49, and 53% were men. With this prospectively collected database, in order to investigate the value of routine follow-up TBE after Heller myotomy, we characterized the TBE measures longitudinally after Heller myotomy, identified important preoperative TBE measures, such as height and width, associated with post-myotomy TBE patterns, and identified TBE temporal patterns associated with reintervention. Our first objective focused on TBE measures after myotomy over time. This is a graph of routine follow-up TBE height at one minute over time. We see an immediate 53, excuse me, the dotted line here indicates the change from a preoperative TBE to first follow-up, and we see an immediate 50% decrease from preoperative TBE at one minute height, which slightly decreases during follow-up as indicated by the solid green line. When we superimpose follow-up TBE height at five minutes with a yellow dotted and solid line, we see a similar immediate postoperative improvement in TBE height that is stable over time. The next measure we examined was TBE width at one minute. Again, the dotted line is the comparison of preoperative to first follow-up, and the solid is the uh, follow-up TBE over time. <clears throat> we see the immediate postoperative improvement from the preoperative TBE, and the solid line shows this is stable. And when we look at five minutes, we observe a similar or expected immediate improvement that is stable over time. So just to briefly summarize these findings, the TBE height and width decreased by more than 50% at first follow-up, and on average, this remains stable or slightly decreased at up to five years. Our next objective, we looked at the relationship between preoperative TBE measures with follow-up TBE. I'll just take a moment to explain this graph. So in this three-dimensional graph, we have the relationship of five year, of the width at one minute at five years on the z-axis. Here on the x-axis, we have the preoperative height at one minute. And then on the y-axis, we have the preoperative width. And I apologize, it's actually increasing towards us, if you notice that. And so our findings here are that the preoperative height really demonstrated minimal change in post-myotomy width. However, there is an exponential rise in post-operative TBE width with increasing preoperative width. So just to summarize these findings again, preoperative TBE height is not substantially related to follow-up TBE measures. Wider preoperative TBE width is associated with wider follow-up TBE at the one minute. And then the routine follow-up TBE width demonstrated an exponential rise with wider preoperative width seen on TBE. In our last objective, we looked at the follow-up TBE and reintervention patterns. In this graph, we have the percent of patients who were free from reintervention over time. And at five years, 79% were free from reintervention after their Heller myotomy. 
We took a closer look at this 21% of patients who underwent a reintervention. And here we have a graph which illustrates the reintervention number, first through fourth, the number of patients at each intervention, as well as the type. 113 patients underwent a first reintervention, the majority of which were endoscopic, and only 49 patients required a second reintervention in this cohort. We then compared the TBE patterns in those patients who underwent a reintervention and those who had durable palliation of their esophageal emptying. This graph, again, is looking at the TBE width at one minute over time. The dotted green line are those patients with durable palliation, and those with the solid green line underwent a first reintervention. We observed that on average there's a clear separation between these curves with decreasing width in the group without reintervention. We examined those patients who underwent a first as well as additional reinterventions. The patients who only had a first reintervention are in the dotted line here, and those who go on to additional reinterventions are in the solid yellow. The follow-up TBE width among those who only had one reintervention gradually declined to levels observed in those patients without reintervention, while among those who underwent further reintervention, the width was persistently elevated and even increased. So to summarize these final findings, most patients achieve durable palliation after heller myotomy, and this, I think, is expected given from the previous literature. Patients who require reintervention have higher follow-up TBE measures, and reintervention can improve TBE measures for some but not all patients. In conclusion, TBE provides objective follow-up after heller myotomy. Increased preoperative width warrants closer follow-up to trigger reintervention, as these patients can be further palliated and may even have durable palliation thus preventing the need for further surgery, such as esophagectomy. Because TBE is a valuable non-invasive tool, we recommend that it should be employed for routine follow-up of patients longitudinally after Heller myotomy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you please identify yourself and uh, ask a question? Uh, Bill Richards from Mobile, Alabama. That was a really nicely presented study and a very, very nice study. Thank you. So you said at the outset that uh, symptoms, the patient's symptoms, do not correlate with the TBE. Do you have any data that shows that? I'm not aware of any data that really shows that. So, uh, you know, the first study that jumps to mind, we've, we've published several times on the, the poor correlation. I, you know, the routine practice, I think, of many physicians to look at Eckhart scores, none of which have been really effectively validated in a sense. However, uh, Vasey and colleagues in 2011 showed that up to 30 or 40 percent of patients who have complete report, complete response, complete uh, relief of symptoms, still at one year will have uh, you know, uh, recurrence with, uh, of those symptoms. And if you look at a TBE at eight weeks post follow-up, they actually still demonstrate poor emptying. So in spite of the fact that they're reporting symptom relief, we still have objective evidence that they haven't been effectively palliated. Obviously, these patients never go to a normal emptying time of 14 seconds. But we feel that, and we still actually record symptoms within that cohort, and, and not part of this discussion, but um, if you think about the pathophysiology of achalasia, where you have denervation of the esophagus over time, it kind of speaks to those patients who may be reporting substertal chest pain in reality have objective emptying. But we feel that regurgitation and dysphagia, again, are the ones that can be followed over time, but that an objective assessment and TB is also normalized to the patient. So you can follow that individual patient's emptying over time and identify time points that perhaps you'd want to intervene earlier. Okay, so l l let me go to add it like this. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling me that you're not going to use the patient's own symptoms, then you use the TBE only to determine whether or not to re-intervene in no, these I, patients, as I, or, or, or you use the patient's symptoms. Correct, Dr. Richards says, yeah. did a TBE yeah. and say, say, well, you're emptying just fine, so you don't need to have undergo re-intervention. You see what I'm saying? I do, I do. And so in our own group, we do uh, collect the symptoms. But I think if you have a patient who at one minute, there's minimal TBE column height, meaning that all the barium is evacuated, yet they're re reporting intense amounts of substernal chest pain, I think you would be loath to intervene or subject that patient to a, a pneumatic dilatation. On the other hand, 
if you have reports of regurgitation and you have increasing TBE height or perhaps a very wide baggy esophagus, then perhaps you'd want to offer that patient a dilatation, although um, probably redo heller myotomy would not be something you would offer. And then and as, we, as you would expect for a type 1 achalasia patient with a wide baggy esophagus, esophagectomy is probably in their future at some point.